He was team leader of a Project Pegasus. He's a lawyer, writer, 21st century visionary. Andrew is emerging a figure in the disclosure movement, leading a campaign to lobby the United States government to disclose, disclose such controversial truths as the fact that Mars harbors life and that the United States has achieved quantum access to past and future events, time travel. Andy's writings place him in the forefront of contemporary Mars research. His paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars, published in 2008, was the first work to prove that Mars was an inhabited planet. After publishing his landmark paper, Andrew found the Mars Anomaly Research Center Society. He is also one of America's time travel pioneers. In the late 60s and early 70s, he was a participant in the secret U.S. time-space program, Project Pegasus, which you actually see on Stargate. <laughs> he was the first American child to teleport and took part in probes to pass the to the past and to the future. And then uh, working to, to utilize different forms of time travel for the Department of Advanced Research Projects, or DARPA. For 10 years, Andy has investigated his experiences in Project Pegasus on a quest to prove them and communicate them to others. Andrew's website is projectpegasus.net. Please welcome to Free Your Mind, the stage, of great men. Um, as Freeman was stating, I've been waging a truth campaign really with two components. Um, the first has been uh, my attempt to articulate my experiences in Darkless Project Pegasus as a child in the early 1970s so that the people of this country and the world know the truth of the, of the matter, which is that the U.S. government secretly achieved numerous forms of time travel um, by 1970. I was one of the children that was brought into those activities for a number of reasons. And I presented that story uh, when I last had the pleasure here appearing at the Free Your Mind Conference in April of 2011. The other major component of my truth campaign has been to establish not only the fact that Mars is an inhabited planet, but that our government, the United States government, has been sending U.S. chrononauts to the planet Mars since the late 1970s and has established a secret colony there. And that's established not only on the basis of my testimony, but now six others who have come forward and a few new names that I'm going to share with you today. Here's, um, in this image, we have one of the Martian life forms that I call plesiosaurs, because they're very similar to the plesiosaurs that uh, uh, were rife on this planet before the KT extinction event. Now, today I'm going to focus on my experiences, not as a child in Project Pegasus, but when I was at UCLA as an undergraduate in the early 1980s, and I was involved, I was basically re recalled into government service as one of the college-aged uh, chrononauts attached to the CIA's Junk Room Program. Just to give some uh, backstory here, our brilliant friend Jay Widener theorizes, that is he said, he states that he's concluded, that the, the Illuminati conspiracy begun by uh, Adam Weishaupt in the 1770s uh, was a multi-generational conspiracy to found the United States of America so that we could restore the status quo ante prior to the solar system catastrophe around 9500 BC and place a human presence from Earth back on Mars again. And isn't it curious that we have the Great Pyramid on our national currency, on our one dollar bill? I would also note that we're living in a time that one of my fellow jumpers in the Mars Jumper program of the early 1980s, um, a same age peer by the name of, of Barack Obama, who's currently clearly president of the United States, then using the name Barry Satoro, was not only trained with us, but we were deployed operationally 
sometimes in the same jump room, sometimes meeting up on the surface of Mars, and that this individual has now twice been elected President of the United States, and the only public controversy that's been raised about his background is whether or not he's a natural-born citizen under Article II of the Constitution. In fact, he was a direct participant in the Mars Jump Room program of the CIA, and hence is a veteran of the secret space program. So, you know, when I last appeared here, we were talking about the historical lag of 40 years and the fact that we crossed the threshold of time travel by 1970. Here we have a situation where this young Democrat president has been elected twice now by the American people. And we don't know really anything about him as a result of the sealing of his records. And despite the hundreds of radio interviews I've done and the numerous public appearances, there has been no mainstream journalistic attention focused on um, President Obama's service in the Jump Room program. So I'm going to be sharing some of that with you today. Now, my personal experience um, in the Mars Jump Room program of the early 80s had its roots in my service on Project Pegasus as a child under the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Most of my activities were focused on teleportation, which involves opening up a vortal tunnel in time space and sending somebody through it to a distant location that we would refer to as the past or future. And another technology called chronovision, a chronovisor is an electro-optical device that creates a field of supercharged particles that are so dense that you can identify the residual signal of a past event or the potential signal of a future event, magnify it, that is amplify it, and bring it into the laboratory. Either to use that hologram for as a form of remote viewing, or if you're immersed in the hologram when it's formulated on the stage of the device, you experience going to that, um, going to that time and place. So chronovision ultimately becomes a form of time travel. And uh, I was involved in Project Pegasus initially in 1967-68 when I first teleported between New Jersey and New Mexico as a six-year-old. And um, I was officially brought in in the fall of 1969. And I, I was involved in different forms of time travel until the end of the summer of 1972 when I was nearing age 11. And during those four years, I had four hidden summers in New Mexico as a result of teleporting there, spending time there, involved in secret project activities, and then teleporting to back to New Jersey, arriving on the afternoon of the day I had originally left. So the timeline here is somewhat convoluted because they were using time loops to create places where we would do secret work for the Defense Department and then collapse those time loops by having us teleport back to the day we left on the East Coast. During those years of being immersed in Project Pegasus, there were five foreshadowings of the fact that I would find myself going to Mars as a college student 10 years later. The first was uh, around 1968, the time I first began teleporting to New Mexico. My father came home to our, uh, our home in our house in Mars Plains, New Jersey from uh, the offices of the Ralph M. Parsons Company, which were then still in New York City. They were on Wall Street in New York. He was clearly inebriated, and he gathered my siblings and, and, and my mother and I into the living room of our house uh, in Mars Plains because he said that he wanted to read something to us that somebody had written about the first discovery of life on Mars and how hilarious it was. And what he then spent about 15 minutes narrating were passages from my 2008 paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars, that were the most fanciful or farcical. Because somebody, I, I ran to my father and I grabbed the file that he was reading from out of his hands and it said, Andrew Bishago, The Discovery of Life on Mars, 2008. So by then they not only had my 2008 paper, but it had been in the possession of the CIA, which my father was a, basically aligned with as a defense community engineer for Parsons, and had actually bulgarized the content of that paper to, to miss. Uh, to, to, to deceive my dad about what I had written about. About a year later, 1969, he's giving me a haircut up in the bedroom part of the house there, and he puts the razor down and goes to a manila envelope, un unties the envelope, and says, take a look at this, son. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's a Martian. And I said, what do you mean a Martian? He says, it's a, it's a 
a human being like us, except it's on Mars. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, guess who discovers it? And I said, who? And he goes, you do. NASA sent some robots, some rovers, up to Mars, um, among other activities directed at the Red Planet, and sends photographs back, and you analyze those photographs, and in 2008 you, wrote, you write a, a paper containing the first images of humanoid beings on another planet. Here's one of them that you publish in your paper. So at this point, 60, by 1969, I'm being officially brought into Project Pegasus, they have the paper, and uh, the CIA has comprehended the significance of these images from NASA uh, photograph PIA 10214, which is a western view taken from the home plate plateau of the west valley of the Columbia Basin of the Gusev Crater of Mars. And that photograph is chock full of evidence of ancient artifacts and biological beings on Mars. About a year later, summer of 1970, we're, I'm just hanging out on a Saturday morning at our house in Mars Plains, and my dad says, come on, son, we've got to go over to Curtis Wright, the place where the teleport was located. And we're in the car, and I say, you know, why do we have to go to Curtis Wright, Dad? Are we going to be jumping to, uh, to New Mexico again? And he said, no, there's some Martians over there, and they want to meet you, because apparently what had happened is that on a technical liaison activity with Martian aerospace engineers who had come here to transfer technology to our aerospace community, a discussion about my paper about life on Mars that wouldn't be published until, what is that, um, 38 years later, had been discussed with the Martian representatives, and they wanted to meet the child who would grow up and write this paper. So I went over to Curtis Wright with my father, and we met three homely, bald, Caucasian man, I'm using Jackie Coogan and Mike Myers here to represent them, um, very close. They basically were Caucasian looking men from a narrow gene pool. Well, how big is the gene pool on Mars? It consists of four different typologies, but only numbers, about a million individuals living primarily on the Martian surface. So these are very narrowly genetically focused individuals, and they tend to be a little bit on the homely side. 1971, I'm recovering from bronchitis. We're going out when I was sick on Halloween of 71. And uh, my dad comes into our guest bedroom where we're always convalescing with our childhood illnesses and says, uh, take a look at this son. And he hands me my 2008 paper. Why? Because since the advent of time travel in 1967-68, the CIA and other alphabet agencies in the United States government have been sourcing written material and information on microfilm and other forms from the future. In this case, they had a copy of my 2008 paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars. So my dad handed me the paper, and I knew it was a, an artifact from the future because it had a copyright date of 2008. My dad said, take a look at the date. How old are you going to be then? I said, well, in 2008, I'm going to be 47. He said, yeah, when you're 47, you write this paper. Um, and we noted the fact that it contained my middle initial D, which, as a Roman Catholic, I wouldn't take Daniel as a confirmation name until our move to Southern California in 1972-73 time frame, or even a after that, you know, at age 13 in California. So that was anomalous too. I, reckon, I saw my name, but I had a middle initial that I didn't recognize. And it was also printed in Microsoft Word for Windows ARIA 12-point type font that didn't exist at that time. So my dad said, um, Andrew, the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to go away for a couple hours. I want you to read your paper from the future, all of the text, study all the photographs of life forms and ancient artifacts on, on Mars that you place in this paper in the future, and then read the captions and try to late, relate the material in the captions to the photographs. And I said, well, why, Dad? If I'm going to write this anyway, based on analyzing NASA's images from Mars, why do you want me to read it before I, I write it? It can't be any better than when I'm going to write it, right? In terms of what goes into it, it's just kind of a quantum paradox. And he said, well, we think that's probably the case, but just to be on the, on the safe side, when you do write the paper 37 years from now, 38 years from now, we want it to contain as much information about life on Mars as possible. So this gets into the whole issue of how prior knowledge of future events may influence those events. They were doing sort of what I call a quantum enrichment activity where they were making sure that I read 
one version of my paper on a timeline so that it would be the best possible expose of life forms on Mars, whatever timeline I ended up being up on by the time I wrote the paper. But it was the paper. I wasn't given their paper. Some people have said, well, you were brainwashed or you were memorized their paper. No, I spent a goodly part of 2008 researching and writing that paper and actually went into seclusion in December of 2008 for three weeks during a snowstorm in Portland, Oregon, where I was then living, to write this paper from scratch. So it was, it was a quantum artifact from the future that my father handed me. 1972, my project activities on Project Pegasus are winding to a conclusion. My dad comes back to the La Hacienda restaurant in Old Town, Albuquerque, New Mexico where his longtime friend uh, and sometimes companion, Mary Constance Chavez, worked as the cashier and sometimes waitress there. And my dad was just, he looked like he'd been punched in the stomach. Uh, something, he was thunderstruck from something. And so my dad says, stay here, Andy. I want to talk to Connie about something. He took Connie across the restaurant. And I meandered over there, ultimately, to listen to what they were talking about. And the only thing I heard is, by Connie Chavez, she said, well, does he go up there before or after he publishes the paper with all those critters up there? So apparently what had happened is my father, who had placed me in Connie's care there, sort of babysitting me at, her, at the restaurant where she worked, he had been in some kind of technical meeting with other Parsons engineers and the CIA and people on the project and so forth, DARPA people, and apparently he had been told that some of the kids on Project Pegasus, including myself, were ultimately going to be teleporting to Mars because that is, in fact, what they were, they were talking about, Mars over in the corner of the restaurant. Okay, so I leave Project Pegasus as, just about the time I'm going, age 11, in fall of 72. I have an ordinary junior high and high school period in Southern California. I do it my first year of college at UC San Diego, put an inter-campus transfer from UCLA, and coming in the fall of 80. But in the summer of 80, my father announces to me in the household there in Chatsworth, California, he says, son, you're going to be going on a camping trip again this summer, but it's just going to be a father and son camp camping trip. And I said, oh, really? Where are we going, Dad? He said, we're going to be going back to Lake Siskiyou near Mount Shasta. Uh, here's a very beautiful picture of Lake Siskiyou near Mount Shasta. And uh, so, you know, next Saturday we'll be getting up really early and loading the boat and going up there. And uh, so I just thought it was an ordinary camping trip. I was expected to do some fishing with my dad, maybe some water skiing, just hang out. On the, there's a campsite there on the northern shores of Lake Siskiyou. It's actually kind of where this camera was when this picture was taken. And uh, so we head up the I-5 corridor in California, which encompasses most of the state. Shasta's pretty far north. And the first strange thing that happened is when we got to exit 745 off the I-5 corridor and went about nine miles to McLeod, California, my dad parked our, our station wagon and the boat, towing the boat, in this parking lot in front of the McLeod Market, which is a major sort of grocery store there in McLeod, California. And he said, son, I'm going to be going into the store for about 15 minutes. Uh, what I want you to do is just stay in the car. I mean, do everything within your power to stay seated in the car. I'll be out fairly soon. And uh, just leave the car if the car basically catches on fire. Uh, but to try to stay inside the vehicle. And he goes into McLeod Market for about 15 or 20 minutes, comes out, and I'm astonished, because as my dad gets back in the driver's seat, he's got about a five-day growth of beard. And so he must have gone in and accessed the facilities that are underground, un underneath Mount Shasta and the Shasta Dam, which have been there for decades. There was deep underground military bases beneath Shasta. Who knows, maybe that's why they scripted all this, the Shaver mystery and these other Mount Shasta kind of mysteries to cover some of that Defense Department activity in Siskiyou County. And I said, Dad, what, what the hell happened? What, what do you mean, son? Well, I said, you went into the market there 15 minutes ago, clean shaven, and now you have like a five-day growth of beard. And my dad was very clever. He was sort of a, a, an engineer educated at Lehigh who had been consulting the CIA for decades, the Air Force, the Navy. He was from rural Pennsylvania here in this state. He was born in Summit Hill, Pennsylvania, on the kitchen table in May of 1923. So he was a clever survivor of a pretty deprived childhood here in this state during the Depression. And he said, what do you mean, son? You know whenever we go camping, uh, I let my beard grow. 
And I said, yeah, it, it doesn't grow five days growing the beard in 15 minutes yet, so, so I know you've been up to something. Unbeknownst to me, that same weekend, a 13-year-old growing up in, a junior high school student growing up in La Cunada, California, William Brett Stillens, that weekend was having an identical experience. His dad tells him they're going to go on a father and son camping trip, he pulls the car up to uh, the McLeod Market, and actually, Brett says that his father, Tom Stillings, actually shaved before going into the market. That must have been the phone call that my dad placed to somebody uh, when we were there that weekend. Now, when I started my campaign to tell my experiences in the U.S. Time Space Program, everybody was telling me, there's things you're not going to remember. And arrogantly, I was saying, well, I've spent about 10 years on this, from 1999, 2000, the present. You know, it's 2010, I've been lecturing about it, appearing on Coast to Coast AM and other uh, mainstream media venues about it and so forth. And I said, I think I've got everything about what happened to me. So, William B. Stillings calls me on April 23rd of 2010, after hearing me on Coast to Coast AM on November 11th of 09, and says, we basically have to talk. And I said, why? And he says, because I know who you are. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we work together. And so I thought maybe this was one of the kids who had been in Project Pegasus in the early 70s. And I said, well, where did we work together and when? And he goes, you don't remember the campground at Mount Shasta? And what then followed were hundreds of hours of Skype calls between Brett and I, where we began to, to reformulate in our minds an understanding of what had happened that summer. The first race thing that happened is that Brett and his father showed up after my dad and I had already uh, set up our tent in the campground there at Lake Siskiyou. And then his dad came over to our campground and said to my father, he introduced himself to me and said to my dad, uh, I don't, I'm not sure you know who I am, but we work for the same company. Well, that wasn't Parsons or Tom's employer, that was the CIA. That's some of that spook speak, you know, of the, the CIA being the company. The other strange thing that happened is Brett's had went back to the, at his father's insistence, went back to their van, which I've actually identified as a pumpkin orange van again from that era of the late 70s, and um, got a shoebox out. And Tom Stillings took a piece of metal about this big and about that thin, about the length of a chalk eraser, and said, and took it down above the ground and said, now watch this, Andy. And he said to my dad, I don't have to show this to you, Ray, because you work with this. And basically, as a result of reverse uh, gravitic forces, or magnetic forces, actually, this piece of metal hovered over the ground. So here we have this strange science lesson. I thought we were going to be camping. <laughs> then, then, so, then the next day, promptly at 1 o'clock, without saying anything to Brett and I, my father Raymond and his father Thomas, representing respectively, the Ralph M. Parsons Company, one of the world's largest process engineering companies and a major defense contractor, and somebody working as an operations analyst for Lockheed Skunk Works in Burbank, California, get up without saying anything to each other and start walking across the campground. Brett and I could kind of see which campsite they were going to, so we ran ahead of our fathers into this campsite. And between, between a camper and a car, we met this individual. Edwin Aldrin, the second human being to walk on the moon in this epoch of human civilization on Earth, this second civilization of human life on Earth. And he knows who we are. So at this point, again, kind of a little bit of an air of unreality is kind of dwelling here, certainly in my mind, I think in Brett's as well. Uh, Brett's highly intuitive. I believe he was ultimately involved in the jump from program because he's a technical genius. So he's very right-brained. He kind of looks over me like, why is Buzz Aldrin at this campground? And before we could say anything to astronaut Aldrin, he was just dressed in ordinary camping clothes, not his space suit. Um, he said, Andy, Brett, it's a pleasure to meet you, boys, or fellas. Um, well, let me tell you, you two are going to be doing something I did a few years back, and that's go off planet. Well, let me tell you, fellas, it's going to be the opportunity of a lifetime. So it's like, wait a minute, I thought we were going to be going fishing here, Dad. <laughs> you brought him into a meeting with the second man to land on the moon. This is getting a little bit disconcerting. So that night around the campfire, about 10 o'clock, you've got the beautiful Milky Way galaxy above you. 
Shasta can often be seen in the moonlight hovering over as this white uh, mystical uh, object, sacred mountain. And uh, the sparks are going up and toward the, the heavens. And my dad looks at me and then over at Brett and back at me and said, says, boys, you're going to be taking some classes tomorrow. And I said, in what, Dad? I thought we were going to have a camping trip this summer. He goes, no, I, we, we brought you here because you're going to be involved in an educational curriculum here in Siskiyou. And I said, where? And he said, up the, up the freeway a couple stops at College of the Siskiyous. And I said, about what? And he said, everything to do with Mars. And I said, Dad, I just completed my astronomy and you know, breath requirement at UC San Diego. I don't want to become an astronaut. I'm going to be a history major in the fall at UCLA, maybe write for the school paper. I don't want to go into space. Why do we have to know anything about Mars? Why does breath? And my dad looked at me and said, because some of you kids in the program are going to be going there. So now, not just Edwin Buzz Aldrin, but my beloved dad is telling me that we're going to Mars. The next morning, that first Monday of the three weeks we spent there, our fathers drive us up to the College of the Siskiyous Extension in Wairika, California, not in Weed, where their main campus is. And at this prison-like extension building, uh, we met our instructor, Major Ed Ames of remote viewing fame, who was then serving, as he can find up, if he still has it on his own website, you know, in his biography on his own website, he was then serving as a scientific and technical intelligence officer for the U.S. Army, the very person you would use to, as a briefing officer for, for U.S. personnel going to Mars or any other planet. We spent several days at the um, extension building, and during that first day meeting Ed and eight other teenagers and college students, Brett and I were removed. I know that mind control has been one of the themes of this, this, uh, this gathering here. Brett and I were individually removed from the room after being told we were going to be taken into the next room and tortured. We were taken into a small college room, kind of like those half rooms you have in chemistry labs with counters, black scientific counters. And there, an army officer and a scientist in a white lab coat talking to us in very quiet terms told each of us, and Brett and I have corroborated this, that if we talked about going to Mars over the next several years, we would be physically tortured. Of course, I had been physically tortured when I left Project Pegasus as an 11, almost an 11-year-old, and I had overcome that torture to tell the true account of having time travel. But in this case, right before we even really are getting acclimated to the classroom setting, we're removed from the room under the belief we were going to be taken to the next room and tortured, and then really told in no uncertain terms that we would be tortured if we talked about the program to anybody without a need to know. A couple days later, we, our class moves to the Life Sciences building. Uh, they're right in the, in the volcanic apron there, Mount Shasta behind it, uh, at the WE California campus of uh, College of the Siskiyous. And Brett and I have reconnoitered the grounds and for hours. We, we drove up there from where he lives in Southern California and walked the campus for hours and confirmed different memories of being physically there. Ed gives us a three-week factual seminar about everything about Mars from its geology and hydrology into what the U.S. government's goals were for sending thousands of U.S. chrononauts to the Red Planet, beginning in the late 70s. It's now 1980. The three major goals that we remember him emphasizing are that they were hoping to use the jump room program to establish an extraterrestrial defense regime protecting the Earth. Now, I don't think they just meant a, a defense regime against hostile extraterrestrials. I believe they meant from basically protection from all of the above. After all, the first civilization on Earth was devastated around 11,500 years ago by debris from space that also struck Mars. So it would certainly be very rational, especially because Mars is in an irregular orbit around the Sun and comes in and out of proximity to Earth to sort of station defense positions on Mars so that they could, for example, use rocketry to take out asteroids that might hit the Earth. So I don't think they were just referring to uh, extraterrestrial beings. They certainly knew from decades of contact that there are very benevolent, 
very neutral and some hostile extraterrestrial species that have been visiting us. It's sort of all of the above, just like it is on Earth. You have sharks, you, you, have, you have dolphins, uh, sturgeon, and sharks. You have basically altruistic and positive, neutral, and malevolent, malevolent and negative visitors from space. So I think it would include that, but not be limited to extraterrestrial beings. The second goal that uh, Dames emphasized was to create a basis for claiming U.S. territorial sovereignty over Mars. And their plan was to put some people up as settlers and have some people going up as short-term visitors. So in the same way that different countries have claimed territorial sovereignty over Antarctica, they could do something similar under public international law with Mars. And then the third uh, reason was to acclimate the Martian humanoids and animals to our presence. So clearly to basically wage planetary hegemony slowly to ultimately take Mars over on behalf of our human civilization on Earth. So the, those three weeks of lecturing emphasized things like what to expect upon arriving on Mars via the jump rooms. We did a practical exercise with a mock-up of the jump rooms there in Wheat, California. There was a major part of the curriculum was about learning both the inevitably lethal and the possibly lethal predators on the surface. What to do if we were basically trapped by one of the inevitably lethal predators, which was basically to sit down on the ground and allow them to eat us, rather than make them angry and toy with us while they were making lunch of us, um, and how to operate as a team on the surface. My proudest moment on Mars was when I walked out of the jump room facility called the Corkscrew because of its conical or a conch shell shape. And um, I saw a gray ET, a gray, uh, one of the Martian humanoids that looks like a gray ET up on the roof observing us. And because of our training there at Ed Danes where we were taught how to yell something kind of in an abbreviated way to give a fellow team member an understanding of what you had just encountered, I yelled, Court, Brett, a gray, on the roof, observing us. So that was my, my proudest operational <laughs> moment <laughs> because it was exactly what we've been instructed in terms of this staccato kind of informing of your teammates. Because if you didn't do that, you might suddenly find one of them being swept away by a dinosaur-like creature 12 to 16 feet tall. Um, so that, that training came online there. To illustrate this, here are three images that I derived from NASA image PI-10214 that show the plesiosaurs, which would clearly be in the potentially non-lethal non-inevitably lethal predators. But when Courtney Hunt again, and I were chased back to a skull on the surface to get egress back to the jump room underground, one of the jump rooms, we were chased by one of these that looked like the creature in the middle. It looked like a boulder with a periscope coming out of it. But that's basically a body and a neck and a kind of a Loch Ness monster kind of uh, terrestrial reptile. And we did evade that because I'm here to tell the tale. Courtney certainly wasn't bitten either. But when we scampered down the steps to the jump room per se, I said, because I, I, you'll find out I was, I was amnestic about my training for, for good reason. And I said, is that thing, I said, is that thing a carnivore? And he said, hell yes, it has teeth. It has jagged teeth all the way down his throat. Okay, so this would be one of the slower movement, but potentially lethal predators, just as if you could be you know, between a bear and its child, you know, in, in, or, or go by, a, let's say, a grizzly bear or a puma, you know, mountain lion will stalk humans on Earth. These animals weren't that fast. They were in the sort of the second category of threat. But nonetheless, Mars is a desert planet that was severely damaged by the solar system catastrophe. Most of its ionosphere was blown off. It is deficient in oxygen. It has minimal vegetation and water. And it, it's a biome that consists of essentially 30 or so land species engaging in constant, moderate predation against each other. Very much like that biome that Captain Cousteau found on Clipperton Island, which is 1,300 miles west of Baja, California, where you have a mass die-off like this, you have a very, you basically have a very flat ecosystem where different animals are eating each other, sometimes even cannibalizing their own species and again, it doesn't collapse as a food chain or an ecosystem. Okay, so that was a, that's a taste of what Ed Dames treated us to in his three-week seminar. We know that there were 10 teenagers enrolled. First, of course, 
the Honorable William Brent Stillings. I credit Brett with allowing my memories to come forward because had he not, I wouldn't be here today talking about the Jump Room program. I was absolutely blocked on this set of memories as a college student while during the last 10, 12 years I've been able to readily access my childhood experiences. So memory is not only imprecise, it's somewhat paradoxical. Memories are stored in different neural networks in the brain, some of which can be shut off, but the memories are still there. So here's Brett today. Um, and again, the mechanical genius. Brett was such a prodigy with mechanical engineering that he was repairing television sets at age four without training. So, you know, I'm more of a scholarly left brain kind of personality. I think Brett was involved, and I say this quite sincerely, because they believe that if the, if the jump room facility on Mars broke down, he would be able to fix it and get us home. So uh, I, I do credit Brett uh, with, um, you know, I really thank him for coming forward. I think we, we, we all can. The next individual that Brett and I and our later whistleblower Bernard Mendez agreed was one of our fellow jumpers, was a young man from Hawaii named Barry Satora, who was then attending Occidental College in Eagle Rock, California. Today we know him as the 44th President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. The fourth person, including ourselves, that we've been able to identify as five of those 10 teenagers, had just entered the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, uh, in fall of 1979, when I entered UC San Diego as a 17-year-old. Uh, this young lady entered Caltech as a 16-year-old. Regina Dugan was born on March 19th of 1963. So she had just turned 17 in March of 80 when she was the sole female out of those 10 teenagers in our class. And we got to know Regina very well as a friend and classmate. Here she is today, around our time, in a photograph that was taken when President Obama appointed her the 19th director of DARPA the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the very defense agency to give us time travel, as not only the 19th director in the history of that agency, but the first woman to serve in that pre prestigious position in the defense community. I like to say, well, in terms of the feminist dimension of this, of the history of this, at the time that Sally Ride was being lauded as a female spatial astronaut, Regina Dugan was taking the jump room to Mars. So this is just an example of the way that we've been culturally hurt by the abuse of official state secrecy, which is what we have to end, and which I will end if I'm elected President of the United States. <laughs> Great morning. The fifth person we've been able to identify is um, somebody who's clearly more of on the military side. He had decided to go to Annapolis when he was invited, as I had declined when we were uh, high school students. William Cameron McCool, was five days younger than me. I was born on September 18th of 61. William McCool was born on September 23rd of 61. And when he introduced himself to our class, he identified the fact that he was, had just done his plea year at the Naval Academy, and that we, what we needed to know that was that he was cool. And that was the mnemonic device he was giving us to remember, that his name was William McCool. Willie went on to join, uh, to, to be a Naval aviator, who then joined the space shuttle uh, program in 1996 at age 35. And sadly, he died as the pilot of Space Shuttle Columbia when it disintegrated, coming into Earth's atmosphere on, Mar on uh, February 1st of 2003. What I also remember fondly about Willie in the program, we did see him at the jump room. He trained with us for about a week and a half, and I reminded Greg, wait a minute, we would run into Willie at the jump room facility because every time I walked past him in the hall, he had this kind of characteristic way of looking down and saying something sarcastic at you. Like he'd say, oh, Andy, you're, you're still in the program. So he had kind of a Don Rickles kind of com comedic thing going. So Brett and I uh, you know, feel sad that he died um, in the Columbia disaster. We don't know the other uh, five participants. We have some clues. And we're all speaking out to try to get those people to come forward. Um, curiously, the five that we've been able to identify all had Pasadena, California connections. I was the son of a father who worked for Parsons, then in Pasadena, California. Here's their Pasadena headquarters building on West Walnut Street there in Pasadena. My dad had worked for Parsons since 1966. Barry Sotoro Obama 
had just done a year at Occidental College in Eagle Rock, which is a suburb of Pasadena. I mentioned Regina having just done her freshman year at Caltech in Pasadena. Brett's father, Tom, then going on to work at NASA JPL in Pasadena. Recently, his mother told me that she thinks he may have worked at NASA JPL in Pasadena before he moved over to Lockheed Skunk Works. And then, of course, William Cameron McCool uh, was one of 14 Americans to die aboard uh, a space shuttle disaster. So, um, and as a sampling technique, that's five out of five, so that really strongly implies a NASA JPL connection to our selection, or otherwise, how would the five out of ten we've identified have been connected to Pasadena? There were three parents who always audited Ed Dame's lecture. The first was my father, who had earned um, a BS in electrical engineering from Lehigh in 1951. He was associated with the International Electrical Engineering, I think it's exhibition or something like that, or ensemble. And I found the fingerprints of the IEEE -E -E all over the hidden history of US time travel. He entered classified aerospace work in 1952, three months after the famous July 1952 overflight. Uh, in, in October of 52, he was approached at his place of employment by a military officer who directed him to report to Curtis Wright the next Monday to work on the ramjet engine. This would have been one of the responses to the ET presence that they found both at Roswell and possibly the Aztec crash. And certainly by July 1952, they had Nine flying saucers clocked at traveling at 7,000 miles per hour at Langley Air Force, or Air Force Base, hovering over our nation's capital, literally hovering over the Capitol building. So my dad basically entered clandestine engineering work in October of 52. He designed the metal alloy for the ramjet, for the, the fuselage and the wings and, and engine and so forth of the ramjet plane. And he, in the time travel area, I know based on his conversations with me that he had repeated Nikola Tesla's Vortal teleportation experiments when he was employed at the Edison Labs in West Orange, New Jersey from 1956 to 64. He explained to me one time how he was magnetizing his metal coils and doing things like dropping a penny or a, um, a pool chalk, you know, billiards chalk through the, through the cylinder. And sometimes it would come out too soon, too late, or disappear. And after I was on coast the first time, somebody who grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, described for me how in 1956, he found a 1958 penny in the street in Montclair. I said, hey, that might have been one of my dad's pennies that he <laughs> escorted two years back to the past by, by repeating some of Tesla's teleportation experiments. Tom Stillings had a Navy background. Many of us, and this goes to the civil rights dimension of our experience, it's my position that those of us who were conscripted into these defense projects, not salaried, not medically monitored, not given coverage under the GI Bill of Rights, not being given military decorations for moments of high heroism on another planet, were the victims of a per se violation of the 13th Amendment by the government, which bans not just with state action, not just on behalf of the government, but bans private individuals as well from subjecting others to slavery and involuntary servitude because that's what was done to these young people and children in these classified defense projects. So I'm speaking out as a lawyer who swore an oath of attorney to uphold the U.S. Constitution when I um, became a member of the Washington Bar on November 15th of 1996. This was wrong, it was criminal, it was unconstitutional, and as a result, these individuals have not been medically monitored. We have our own debts for our hospital care, for our education. We have medical symptoms that are not going covered by the military insurance system. And so I'm speaking out to get redress for this class of potential plaintiffs. <laughs> that that doesn't include me, but thousands of Americans are in this public. My estimate is that about 50,000 members of our generation were brought into these programs as children and young adults. And that's a lot of Americans. Some of them are amnestic about their service because brainwashing was being used on them. So something very sinister happened in the defense community around these projects. Um, I'm not naive about that. I mentioned Greg's father, Tom, serving with Lockheed. He was also an engineer like my father. He 
had been a naval officer. We were told when we did our first jump to Mars that we'd become lieutenants in the Navy. I was told by Courtney Hunt of the CIA that when I got my Juris Doctor and had further you know, educational uh, attainment that I had been secretly made a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy. But again, I've never seen my records. They've never confirmed it, and I've received zero in anything from the Navy or any other intelligence agency or branch of the service. So I'm being accused of being a CIA operative or some guy who was a victim of Navy mind control. And my answer to that is, show me the money. I mean, I've been supporting my whole truth campaign around this information for 12 years with my own earnings as a lawyer and solo practice. And I mentioned Tom's NASA connection. Why do I know it was Barack Obama? Because I met him and his mom. It's the wonderful Stanley Ann Dunham. Stanley had been a consultant to USAID in Kenya and Indonesia, where she married in both of those countries. Uh, in the early 90s, she went on to earn a PhD in anthropology from the University of Hawaii. It is speculated, and there's a lot of evidence, that um, different journalists have published, indicating that while working for AID, she was working as an agent for the CIA. And what I remember about Stanley is that she was very intelligent and very scholarly. <coughs> and I can say that because she gave an afternoon lecture on cross-cultural communications in the event that we would encounter Martian humanoids and have to communicate with them. And she used examples from her marriages to a Kenyan gentleman and an Indonesian gentleman to, to illustrate some of her points about cross, effective cross-cultural communication. This comes very close, actually, to how her physical appearance. She's a little bit older than this picture um, when she was also audited in the class on behalf of her son. <coughs> the strange, one, probably the strangest fact about the jump from training class that I was in and about the program itself, that for some reason they decided to put two future U.S. presidents together as fellow trainees and as fellow chronomots. What do I remember of some of my interactions with Barry as we knew the president? Well, shortly after the program began, we were walking out of class at the conclusion of that lecture, that day's lecture, and Barry came up beside me and made, made a, a very telling point. He said, you know, I really can't get my mind around the fact that they're asking us to do something that most humans have never done before. And I said, you know, go to Mars? He goes, yeah, go to another planet. This is unprecedented. You know, they're telling us that the ancient civilization went there, and we're not the first, but we really are participating in something that's totally new. And I said, yeah, I can hardly believe it. It's amazing. Another reason that I know it was the president is that one time walking into class, we were talking again in similar terms, and I said, listen, man, what's your name? And he said, Barry. And I said, Barry what? And he said, Barry Satoru. And I said, hey, man, our names are kind of similar. They're kind of similar cadence. You know, Andy Bashago, Barry Satoru. So it was the president using his Barry Satoru name we know that he did use his adoptive, uh, you know, his uh, step adoptive stepfather's name in Indonesia, because his kindergarten teacher revealed it to us with this photograph and this record from his kindergarten year, indicating that he was listed as an Indos Indonesian citizen of the Muslim religion and named Barry Satoru. There's also a notation on some of these documents indicating that Barack Obama was also referred to as Sobarka. He and his mother find people. I don't, you know, people have different, obviously different political convictions about a sitting president. The way I try to describe Barry is he was not only intelligent, he was profound, he was highly considerate. I roomed with him for several weeks, and I would, I would estimate that of the several thousand same age peers I met when I was at UCLA for those four years, he would definitely be on the top of the list that I would draft to trust with the presidency. So I'm not speaking out to derogate the president, he's a fine individual. And I think it speaks well of our, our society that we selected him as our chief executive. I'm just telling, telling the truth about the secret defense project that we served in together. We also uh, bonded with Barry and Regina and Brett and I because some of us later moved to the Finlandia Motel in uh, Mount Shasta. And we were having cake parties that Brett was too young to imbibe in beer in. And we were kind of always downloading all of our you know, tension from what Ed Davis had lectured about um, that, that day. And so that became kind of a social function where we got to know our fellow jumpers better. 
Now, why do I say that at least on one timeline they were having two future presidents train together and be involved in this program together? Uh, it's because when I was sitting with my dad behind me, and Brett was over on my right, and Tom still and his, his father was sitting behind him, Barry got up to talk to Major Dames. And uh, Tom Stillings leaned forward and nodded towards Barry's direction and said, Brett, how do you feel being in a future, excuse me, being in a Mars, a Mars program like this with a future president? And before Brett could answer and even like point to Barry and say, what do you mean? That you mean Barry's going to be president? My father chimed in and thrust two fingers in the aisle between he and I and Stillings. And looking at me with his eye twitching, which always happened when he was nervous, he looked at me and with utter seriousness said, two future presidents. Now, thank you. This is very complex. I'm not saying this to get elected president. What I'm doing is I'm revealing it as an essential fact of our experiences under the truth principle. Because look, if I concealed that fact to have a greater chance of being elected, I would violate the very truth principle that I'm fighting for fighting to implement. But that is the truth of what happened, and again, Brett can corroborate that that's what was said. Stanley Ann Dunham was also referring to his son's presidency at our end of the class dinner at the Creamery restaurant in Weed, California. So my point here is not to say that inevitably I will become president myself, as Barry has, upon, let's say, running as an independent in 2016, but simply to say that, look, by 1980, the intelligence agencies were working with specific people based on their prior knowledge of future events. Not just looking every once in a while at a chronovisor to see if the Supreme Court building was underwater, which is one of the findings that we made when we went forward to 2013 in 1971, but literally working with trainees who had been prior identified as people holding positions of higher magnitude in the government or being public figures that they would describe as persons of interest. Okay, so we really have to refocus our focus on the intelligence community and appreciate that for the last 40 years they've been deriving information from the future and by, for the last 30 or more years, working with specific people destined to become a president, destined to become the first one to direct DARPA, etc. People who will be holding the purse strings of trillion dollar expenditures. Okay, so Barry and I were identified as um, future presidents, but I want you to know I'm still using the phraseology if I'm elected president, not when. Because on top of that quantum access knowledge that I do reach the White House, I don't want to lay additional arrogance. And I want to remain humble about the fact that I have to run and the American people will have to vote for me. Not to say, well, you know, I'm going to be president because the CIA said so 80, or 30 years ago. Now the three of us, Barry, Regina, and myself, that summer became CIA analysts to a limited extent. Ed Dames and my father, who I failed to mention was the chief technical liaison between Parsons and the CIA on the theory and practice of Vortal or Tesla teleportation, met with the three of us in Ed Dames' office there, his temporary uh, academic office there at College of the Siskiyous, and they explained to us that they were going to teleport us forward in time and we would be hanging out primarily in the library there at the College of the Siskiyous, the three of us, Barry Regina and myself, to each analyze about five inches of French intelligence reports about the humanoid civilization on Mars, and then write our thesis as to whether that civilization represented a, a threat to human life on Earth, did not, or it could not be determined. When we, at the end of that summer, we then just walked back in to the class because we had jumped forward in time, spent that summer there writing our papers, and then we were just reintegrated back into the class that we had originally gone to, the basic factual seminar. We were walking to Ed Dame's office, and I say, listen, I know we're supposed to still, you know, be under a gag order on this, but before we, you know, at least until we get our papers to Ed, but we're walking our papers over there, so I think I can ask you, what did you determine? I said that I thought we were projecting our fear from our hegemony against another planetary civilization. We had no right to put our personnel there with, without permission. We had no right to territorially acquire Mars, contrary to existing treaties and conventions. Mars doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the Martians. And 
I was troubled that the data, that the 25% of the French data that I can make sense of, as somebody who had done two years of junior high school and two years of high school French, but remembered about 25% of what I had been taught, I said, it's clear to me that this is just, we're just projecting our fear and paranoia on the Martians. Uh, and and Regina got adamantly angry at me and said, what about the incident in one of the reports where two of our astronauts were stranded on the surface of their planet and they promised to rescue them, but then reneged and our astronauts died. And I said, well, do we do that for extraterrestrial visitors? I mean, are we not invading their planet? Why should they try to rescue astronauts or chrononauts from another civilization in their solar system? Why do they have an obligation to rescue our personnel? Have we asked them whether we can build these jump rooms? Have we told them how many humans from Earth were going to be jumping over a certain period of time? But she believed that it showed that they basically they were untrustworthy. And I asked Barry, so Barry, what, what do you decide? And he wouldn't even talk, he didn't even say anything. And I think it's interesting that he reached the presidency first. Because that's one of the issues we're going to have to confront in our culture, which is the pr pressures towards conformity are so great now in our political culture that people who are playing it the safest are becoming our presidents. And I don't mean that to fault Barry, but think of George Washington. You know, here in beautiful historical Philadelphia, you, you, your mind starts going back to Franklin and Jefferson and Washington and Cincinnati. Four horses shot out from underneath him during the Revolutionary War. Four musket balls in his personal cloak. I mean, Washington was lucky to reach the presidency after the Revolution. But Barry wouldn't tell me what he had decided in his thesis when we were walking over to turn them in. And then if you look, there's also been a pattern where in the, in the Illinois state legislature and in the U.S. Senate, he was again playing it safe by not voting, and he reached the presidency. So again, I'm not saying that to fault Barack Obama. I'm saying it because I think that's a major social crisis we have, that those who are playing it the safest are reaching the leadership positions in any organization, let's say in an oil company or, a, or an HMO, uh, because they don't create enemies, they don't create a reputation for being a troublemaker. So we're a lot less healthy a society than we were at, at our founding when a risk taker like George Washington was president than we are now. So there's just an example of a little sidebar of presidential history involving the Obama uh, administration and our, 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 our time in U.S. history. The next summer, summer of 81, I'm introduced to a man that I use the image of Mike Roman, who was that man that they thought was Gordon Campbell at the Robert F. Kennedy assassination site. And, June 5th of 1968 at the Ambassador Hotel in my own town of Los Angeles. But that's not, um, that's not the man I'm using this to represent. But I'm using this to represent a CIA agent named Courtney Maurice Hunt. He was from the Hunt family of Orange County, County California, not of Texas, meaning that he was a cousin of the Watergate and JFK assassination participant, E. Howard Hunt. Courtney was a very scary guy. Um, he was CIA to the core. And you really couldn't ask him a difficult question that he would answer. And when he didn't, when he didn't answer a question you asked him, he looked at you like he was going to kill you. So young men like Brett Barry and I were put under some of these CIA people for additional training in summer of 81. The first thing that Courtney M. Hunt did is he took me to Cal State University Northridge, and he showed me how to use the respiration device that I took and then discarded during my first jump to Mars in July of 1981 as a 19-year-old. He also took me over to Lockheed Skunk Works, Tom Stilling's employer over in Burbank, California, and I took part in this exercise where I learned to always be wary on a 30-second basis of predator, possible predators around me, such as these plesiosaurs and the ones that were inevitably, um, inevitably lethal, which, in trying to describe them, this is the best picture I could find online, of basically a medium tall dinosaur, 12, 16 feet, with uh, a head like a Tyrannosaurus rex, a supple, fast, muscular dinosaur body like a Velociraptor a la Jurassic Park. And when these creatures were in our immediate proximity, let's say from where I'm standing to the columns in the back of this hall, we knew that we had pulled the wrong card and that we were toast. So nonetheless, they equipped us for the smaller predators with a photo flash gun that I was given. It was in a locker there at the jump room facility on Earth, and I'd always put it in my belt. It had a heat 
a stun and a kill mechanism on the tongue. And the watchword was when lighting somebody else's cigarette, do the right thing and put it on heat. Because if you put it on kill, for example, you would incinerate your, your jumping companion's head. <laughs> so we did a couple exercises there at, at College of the Siskiyous about doing the right thing and putting the gun on, on heat and not kill. But even at stun, uh, even at kill, we couldn't kill the, the most vicious predators with this gun. I was also given a cyanide capsule to take in the event that I had no exit. And I, and I, use, I, I symbolize that with this capsule, which shows that they gave me my proper dose of fuckatone <laughs> in the event that I was in the proximity of one of these dinosaurs and wasn't going to be going home, but was quickly going to be metabolized into dinosaur uh, pooper. Uh, so, so we were, the, the, the CIA was operating on somewhat of a merciful basis here by giving me my healthy dose of fuckatol before going up there. <laughs> Nothing like being slowly eaten to death on the surface of Mars by a dinosaur to ruin your, ruin your day. At the end of that summer, five, four, at the end of that summer, Courtney Hunt advised me to transfer to Columbia University. I didn't, but Barry did. In July and August of 81, I went up the first time from the West Coast Jump Room, which was at 99 North Sepulveda in El Segundo, California. Where are these records? Where are these records? Um, there was Toro's records, I'll present Oh, we don't have any, we don't have any uh, of his academic time period records. They're sealed. All those records from school are sealed. And it's, and it's my position that they're probably sealed to hide his involvement in secret defense work and CIA surveillance in other countries, such as when he went to Pakistan in 81. But may, may you permit me to finish, because I'm a little bit pressed for time, but can we pick that up, like at the plenary, if you'd like? Um, first time I go up, I come out of a skull, and there's some people there, I think Regina was there. And then the second time I go up with Courtney, we go over to a cottage and interacted with a man. Ultimately, I was given um, uh, a mission of bringing a, a data disk from a RAND Corporation facility in West Los Angeles up to the jump room. I walked through a dilapidated city and gave it to a telecommunications outpost in this dilapidated city. Uh, just going rather quickly here, I had encountered the three Martian astronauts at Curtis Wright with my father in summer of 70. When I was walking through the dilapidated city, I would see the indigenous Martians who are more sort of elfin in their physiology, and I saw the one ET-like uh, Martian up on the top of the jump room. We have five Mars whistleblowers, Michael Relf, Arthur Neumann, also known as a Henry Deacon informant to Project Cam Camelot. There's Arthur, having gone up more recently for the NSA. William Brett Stillings. Bernard Mendez was the Defense Department investigator of the program. He's come forward and done both mainstream and alternative media around our experiences. A wonderful friend and great spirit, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, has come forward with her account from 2006 and 7 about being invited to go to the Mars colony with her twin boys. Her aunt, Mary Jean Eisenhower, was on a run with Bernie and I up to Mars one time. They were working with families, the Bashago family, the Stillings family, the Eisenhower family. And one time, Bernard and I met Admiral Stansfield Turner, who had just served as President Carter's Director of Central Intelligence on the surface of Mars. So, I guess I'm out of time. Or, um, just to wrap up, one more minute. I, I've done something that's never been done before by a whistleblower. I brought forward two other witness participant whistleblowers, okay? Of course, yes, you know, Jeffrey Wygand with the tobacco companies. Ultimately, you bring more of your colleagues forward. But in terms of deep politics, this trio that includes myself, and then Brett, and then Bernard Mendez, who came forward in 2011, are the first threesome of three, three people who were trained together and were involved operationally in a secret defense project. I can't go through all the fascinating facts that we've corroborated with each other, Bernard, and so forth. But the bottom line is that, just for example, Bernard has confirmed the involvement of Obama, Dugan, Bashago Sr., and Turner. And this is from the man who investigated the program for the Department of Defense. And later in my lecture, I described how Brett believes we were going to the real Mars. Um, Bernie believes we were going to a synthetic quantum environment that modeled the real Mars. 
and states that the jump in technology was given to us by the great ETs. And being a lawyer, I take the middle position that we were going to the real Mars, but via chronovision rather than teleportation. In other words, we were there holographically on the actual surface of Mars. So the bottom line, in the last part of my lecture, I talk about the two presidential denials by President Obama. When was the last time, or the first time, a U.S. president published in an unofficial official statement to knock down something that could be considered a conspiracy theory or an urban legend, which he did in the January 4th, 2012 edition of Wired.com. He had the spokesman for the National Security Council ridicule my account. And ultimately, at the end of my lecture, I basically state that we have to get beyond the Durant report of the Robertson panel of 1953. The next president, whether it's myself or somebody else, has to promise the people that he or she will enforce the truth principle. Truth about what? How about the true nature of the cosmos we inhabit and the true nature of technical development in the latter half of the 20th century? We were supposed to be the, the fulfillment of the Enlightenment. And for us to be, try to again become the fulfillment of the Enlightenment, we have to enshrine the truth principle as an abiding political and social principle and require our presidents to uphold it. And if you elect me your president in 2016, I will. Thank you very much. <laughs>